Hello there friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. I don't know if you guys saw my recent uh, review about the Andor series, but yeah, I, I think it's probably one of the best things that Star Wars has done recently. And one of the reasons I believe this to be objectively true is the fact that Tony Gilroy and Toby Haynes, at least in the first three episodes, have taken a very serious and meticulous approach to filmmaking. This isn't just a Star Wars TV show, this is actually superb cinema. It has clever storytelling, meaningful character development, and a world that is full of information, especially if you look closely enough for it. Like our English teachers in high school used to tell us, color the world around the characters so that information soaks into the viewer's minds subconsciously. So far, Andor has been extremely abundant and rich in detail. While some critics have derided the show for being far too slow, paced, lacking action, and completely not Star Wars, I think these individuals are simply way too used to this quick turnover, straight to stream, release an entire season in one day kind of formula that's been plaguing TV and cinema in the last few years. Let me show you guys what these critics missed in the Andor series. So this is one of my favorite scenes in the new Andor series. It's hilarious and tells you more than you need to know about the character Deputy Inspector Cyril Karn. This is some beautiful show, don't tell. Have you modified your uniform? Perhaps slightly. Pockets piping and some light tailoring. Poor Chief Inspector, he just wants to retire in peace and he has to deal with his asshat. So what exactly did the Deputy Inspector modify? Well, let's take a look. First, he moved the patch on their uniform from just next to his left armpit to the upper chest area a bit higher than where his heart should be. He's also increased the height of his collar just a little bit. Next, Cyril has taken what honestly is a frumpy looking tunic that would be a better fit on a janitor or a mechanic under their coveralls and created a vest of some sort. I'm not sure if it's removable or designed to just look removable. He's taken the orange and red piping to the next level and given the collar and the straps on his vest a bit more of a lining. Next, it seems like he's included some hard inserts, maybe made out of Duraplast, into his vest. I think this is to give it some shape so it looks more like body armor. Actually, this could be a thin profile blaster protection vest. But since Deputy Inspector Karn is a dweeb, I'm going to say this is probably just for aesthetics. In general, though, he did a good job with this uniform. It looks pretty cool compared to the regular frumpy tunic thing that the Chief Inspector is wearing. But then later, Cyril Karn meets with Sergeant Linus Mosk, who is an actual soldier. And behold, it seems like this is where Cyril Karn got his inspiration for his new vest. He's taken his basic Deputy Inspector uniform and turned it into something that the tactical security personnel would wear. If you do take a closer look, there are some minor differences in Cyril and Mosk's uniform, especially in the color area. Also, the pauldron area has a different pattern and the coloring on the piping is a bit different. Oh, and by the way, the reason why Cyril moves the patch from the armpit to the upper chest area is because when you put that heavier armor on, the patch is still visible over the chest plate. Very cool. This is a great example why this show is so awesome. Every little detail has a purpose. That first funny scene we see has a lot of meaning behind it. It shows us a lot about what kind of character Cyril Karn is. He really wants to be in the field and with the tactical forces. But just like his uniform, he's kind of a wannabe. He doesn't really know what he's getting himself into once he enters the battlefield. These two are hilarious. Best of luck to us all. So I seriously hope they don't die too soon. Now, since the first time I saw the trailer for Andor, I knew that the bell tower was going to be important somehow to the main story. I talked about it in one of my last videos. I mean, take a look at this poor guy. He has to walk up the stairs every morning to manually hit this exquisite looking hunk of metal. He uses two anvils, not one, so that he can strike the metal in a quick succession. And the proximity to the loud noise forces him to wear earmuffs. You now, bell towers are common in human society. They're a way of telling time and in a company town or a mining and scrapping town, they can signal the beginning of the workday or the end. But these things can be modernized relatively easily. I mean, you can make an electronic speaker that just belts out the sound. You can make some kind of mechanical device to strike that metal. Heck, you could even have a rope or a chain that extends to the ground floor that you could pull so you don't have to climb up that thing every day. But no, the inhabitants of Ferris don't always do things the easy way or even what most consider the right way. There's a purpose behind everything they do. 
an appreciation for hard work and labor in this case. If you take a closer look at the anvil itself, we see that it has beautiful, intricate engravings all over it. Yet at the same time, this hunk of metal is struck by heavy hammers every day, but has no marks or dents in it, which tells me that this most likely is made out of some very high quality metal. Maybe it's durasteel or something that comes off of a starship or some larger structure. So how do they make engravings in this tough metal? Well, remember a good portion of the people of Ferrex work in salvage, and so they would have the tools to cut apart extremely tough and heat resistant metals that are used for the holes of a starship. Salvaging is not an easy job. It's, it's relatively hard and it doesn't pay very well. It's not very glamorous, but it tells us that the workers in this uh, town, they can see past material things. They're essentially looking at other people's trash and finding value in it. And better yet, they're turning it into art. And we can see this art all over the town. When the Priox Morolana tactical security forces come for Andor, we see that every household has a hanging ornament made out of scrap. Each one is designed differently and most likely handmade by the salvager who owns that house. Once again, we see the appreciation of art in the city of gruff, blue collar individuals. Were these people completely oppressed and barely making enough to squeeze by, would they have the time or energy to make such intricate and beautiful things? And more importantly, look at how the community gets together and starts a chain of signals to warn the city that the blues are coming and fighting might erupt soon. It tells us that Ferrex is not just a salvaging town surrounded by trash. It's actually a full and vibrant community with a rich culture of its own. These aren't just day laborers. Look at the wallet gloves for the workers and how each one represents a different person with a different style. These are individuals. These are artisans or professionals who can find beauty in their job, which means they'll have something worth fighting for when the corpos and their imperial overlords come and tried to take it away. You guys notice something about the Priox Morlana security force? These corpos, by all intents and purposes, are the bad guys, because this is Star Wars and we need villains and heroes. But what happens in that opening scene when Cassian Andor accidentally kills Sentry Verlo Skiff and his guardsman Kravis Drezer, who by all accounts was... Lucky he wasn't killed years ago. One of the most unpleasant people I've ever met. Yet when Kravis notices that his partner has ceased breathing. <laughs> She's not breathing. No. Burlo! Burlo! He's taking! He's fucked! Burlo! <laughs> you can hear the shock and desperation in his voice. Say what you want about this unpleasant man, but he clearly values life. Following that scene, we have Deputy Inspector Karn, who didn't sleep all night to prepare the report on this murder case that he gives to the Chief Inspector. Two men are dead, sir. Employees, that's not worth staying up for, then I'm not worthy of the uniform. Yes, he's a funny character, and his overzealousness is only matched by Sergeant Linus Mosk. Two men dead, line of duty, colleagues, subrages. Exactly. The thought of anything less than full engagement on a case like this. Unconscionable, sir. These guys are so over the top to the point that they're almost a little bit silly and like comedic relief. But what redeems these two individuals is they legitimately care about the men they work with. Later during the operation on Ferrex where Andor and Luthen escape their grasp and use a decoy speeder rigged with explosives to distract the corporate tactical forces, notice how no one even cares about the two escaped fugitives. There is no call for pursuing them. Instead, here's Sergeant Linus Mosk's reaction. Oh no! Don't keep coming! Don't keep coming! This is Delta One. We need to be the Casamac over. No, 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 this is Delta One. That is the sound of a desperate junior officer who just witnessed several of his men get blown up and injured and potentially even killed. This is so different from how stormtroopers we see in previous Star Wars films act. You know, the cold and helmeted soldiers who just walk over their fallen comrades like machines. But this isn't just a lore thing. It's not that the Priox Morlana security forces are all that different from the stormtroopers. It's more because of who's writing this, who's producing this, and who's making this TV show. Everything here has a purpose and intent behind it. Look at Cassian Andor's face in that first scene when he realizes that he's about 
to cause the death of another individual. Look at that immense sorrow. It's not just anger over the fact that he's being stopped, but a wariness of the constant death that surrounds and follows his life. As a matter of fact, when I saw Andrew's face and, and the expression on it, it really reminded me of that picture of Zelensky when he first visited those mass graves in Bucha for the first time. A lot of people say that Andor is way too dramatic and way too adult and gritty, but I would argue that Star Wars for the longest time has had this really bizarrely casual approach to death that runs completely counter to their supposedly child-friendly entertainment style. I mean, how many times have we seen good guys in Star Wars murder an entire room of people and just brush it off casually with a laugh? Even when Tins gets shot by that one security officer, look at the reaction from his unit. The squad leader immediately takes his weapon and tells him that he's done. There's no laughing, no cartoonish behavior. The squad leader is pissed. Not only does his kid have no discipline, he's taken a life for no reason. As a matter of fact, every time in Andor when a life is taken and there's time to react, those moments are actually given to the audience. We're given time to care and reflect on the loss of an individual's life, even if that individual is a minor character. That's where Rogue One excelled at highlighting the little guy. For the first time in that film, we saw a rebel soldier's death have the same weight as a Jedi or a senator's. And that's because, as we'll talk more about later, everything in Andor has a really severe weight and heft to it. And you can clearly see that the writers who wrote this and the directors who, who directed the actors really paid attention to these minute details, which is of course more rewarding for the viewer. And more importantly, Andor is brutally honest about what death is. It's, it's not fun, it's not to be celebrated over or high-fived over. I wish there were more movies and TV shows like this that bring emotions out of us, make us wiser, and how we see the world. I mean, we need this more than ever, I feel like in today's day and age where we become desensitized to all sorts of suffering in the news and in our entertainment. I mean, I remember when COVID struck New York and thousands of people died here, how so many people laughed at the city's inability to prevent those people from dying. And I also remember when Texas had those terrible storms during the winter and people froze to death in their houses, how people laughed and, and made fun of their energy grid. I mean, it just shows us this disconnect we have from suffering. Like there's truly nothing really that funny about death. And that's why TV shows like this and movies like this that try to bring out that empathy, you know, from the audiences are actually very important for society as a whole. And it's completely hypocritical that Star Wars up until this point didn't allow for any sex scenes or profanity in fear of corrupting young children or, or offending people, but it allowed for wanton amounts of death and destruction to occur on screen without so much as pausing even a second to reflect on it. I mean, those are only three themes that I notice in the first three episodes. There are plenty more details that I haven't talked about. And this just shows us what kind of uh, TV and movie maker Tony Gilroy is. I think we're in a great period of time to have someone like him making Star Wars content. Let me know in the comment section below what you think and also what I miss. Also, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, my name is Alan, reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.